Hi, this is Drew. This uh, is the second part of uh, the two-part series with Dr. Thomas E. Jacobson. Uh, What you're about to listen to is a continuation of the conversation that we started in our first episode. And our first episode was on uh, the Reformation uh, as it took place in the Nordic countries. And this episode is on uh, later things that happened, uh, uh, namely the revivalist uh, movements that happened out of uh, Nordic Christianity. Now, the term revivalist, of course, uh, is usually used as kind of a broad term, and and it describes several movements that have happened through history. Um, Like in England, John Wesley and the Methodist movement, uh, when you get into the continent of uh, Europe, you have the Pietist movement. In fact, that's what Dr. Jacobson is namely uh, speaking to uh, pietism uh, as, that came out of the Nordic countries, um, you know, spiritual renewal movements. And you could also include in there uh, the Great Awakening in, in North America or the first, you know, the, the second Great Awakening, uh, especially, which was, you know, emphasized uh, personal conversion and, you know, uh, uh, religion of the heart and, and everything. And so, um, and so we get into, you know, what, what the, some of the, the characteristics of, of that, that religious phenomenon and the strengths and weaknesses too, of course, like we've, we've uh, kind of talked about it even on previous episodes on this podcast. Uh, but Dr. Jacobson is, is uh, going to, this is really his area of expertise as his dissertation was focused um, uh, in this area um, on uh, Hans Nielsen Hauge, uh, who was a uh, pietist uh, uh religious leader out of, out of Norwegian Lutheranism. And so I hope you enjoy this episode and um, God bless. Speaking now that we're in North America, you've written a lot about the history of Luther's seminary. That's also where, I mean, it's your alma mater. You did your Master of Divinity and your PhD there. Um, was that something that happened when you were studying there? Um, or is it, the, I mean, it's the biggest, I don't know, is it the biggest Lutheran? It's the biggest ELCA seminary. It must yeah. be the biggest Lutheran seminary, right? It's still, America. yeah. It- at least in America and it, probably in the world, and in terms of the number of students that are there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, and a lot of things have changed over the last 10 years at Luther uh, in terms of, and, and this is no one's, I'm not pointing a finger of blame at anyone. Uh, our society has undergone so many changes in terms of the prevalence of online education. Sure. Uh, you yeah. know, the student, the student population there at the seminary is it's much nice. smaller than it was uh, when I was there, uh, it felt like a small college. It really did. Uh, whereas you go there today and then the residential student life is a shell of what it once was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Luther Seminary um, in its present form, actually, a, a huge part of it is the Norwegian Lutheran Seminary. Of uh, It was originally called Luther Theological Seminary. And what happened there was that in 1917, and, you know, this was done intentionally to try to line up with the Reformation anniversary of, uh, so the 400th anniversary of the Reformation. Um, In 1917, leading up to it, there was a big merger planned among three Norwegian American Lutheran church bodies, which had a very complex relationship uh, not always a positive one. Uh, one of the participants was what we call the Norwegian Synod. Uh, officially speaking, I think their title was the Synod for the Norwegian Lutheran Church in America. That was the group that understood itself to be more focused on the Church of Norway, you know, the established Church of Norway. They tended to be a very theologically focused group. Uh, they tended toward more formality in worship and liturgy. The pastors wore vestments, you know, they wore the black cassock and the white fluted collar, uh, just like the Danish church would do. I always wanted to get one of those collars to see what people say on Sunday when I show up with one on. 
<laughs> yeah, they uh, they'd be something to to put on. Uh, you, you don't you don't see too many people wearing them anymore. But uh, the the Norwegian Synod, they had a bit of a contentious relationship with some of the other groups. Uh, the largest of them was called the United Norwegian Lutheran Church, which had been formed from a merger of a few groups prior to that in 1890. Um, and one of the big theological issues that separated them was the issue of how to talk about the nature of election or predestination. And uh, are you elected in terms of, uh, does God elect you unto faith or are you elected in view of foreseen faith? Uh, that was the theological issue. And the third group that joined them was much smaller than the other two, uh, but it was called Haugi's Norwegian Evangelical Lutheran Synod in America. And that group uh, was actually the focus of my dissertation. I have a tendency to root for the underdog, and I was curious to explore this group that kind of marginalized over the years. And I think where you're getting at now is you want to talk about Haugi. Can I quote something from some uh, speech you gave about him? Sure. Before we move into him. Um, and you can explain the context, but um, you're with some people who don't like him. And you say, quote, in their minds, Hoagie was responsible for infecting Lutheranism in North America with legalistic and synergistic attitudes, along with a host of other un-Lutheran emphases. As I listened to my classmates talk about this, I could sympathize with them to some degree. It is not unusual for students who have been recently introduced to new ideas such as Lutheran confessional theology to get a little arrogant about their views and look for straw men to tear down in an effort to feel significant. I have been there myself, and I know the feeling well. But when these fellow students asked me again about my plans for the evening of March 29th, I hesitated. Not only do I dislike parties like that as a matter of personal taste, I wonder if these students really understood what Hans Nielsen Hauge was all about. Was there more to the story of this Norwegian man than what they were saying? Was he nothing more than an uninformed and misguided lay preacher who led people away from their true Lutheran identity? Without knowing much about Hauge myself, I sensed that desecrating Hauge by mocking his memory was inappropriate. I tried to diffuse the situation with humor. I looked at my classmates and said, I love Hauge. I own a complete collection of his works. Stifling laughter, one of them responded, he doesn't have any works. <laughs> I found that funny and I thought it'd be a good opening for who is this guy um as you it sounded like this is a situation and you can explain more what the situation was you're at some type of social gathering but um it seemed to have uh inspired you to then look into studying this man so tell us about him mm -hmm. well Hans Nielsen Hauge is probably one of the most famous Norwegian figures in history uh, there are other famous Norwegians, um, people like Henrik Ibsen, um, Henrik Vergeland, uh, and so forth. But Hans Nielsen Hauge definitely ranks up there. And he's a controversial figure among some. Uh, Hauge was born in the late uh, 18th century. And, and um, sometimes people think that Hans Nielsen Hauge was some sort of... Uh, originator of the pietistic tradition of Lutheranism in Norway. Now, I, I just want to say broadly, before I say anything else, trying to define pietism is a very difficult thing. Uh, what people classify as pietism kind of really is quite diverse. Uh, not all people who were pietists uh, necessarily agreed with each other. On, What's the negative on everything. definition uh, of it? it well, a lot of people consider pietism to be overly focused on subjective feelings, uh, the need for uh, the need for constant uh, reassurance, uh, being led back and forth by your emotional states uh, for your assurance of salvation. Other people criticize pietism for legalism, uh, prohibiting people from trying to have fun. Uh, not wanting people to drink alcohol, not wanting to dance, and so forth. I mean, there's some truth to all of those labels. But a lot of what pietism actually was, was a, a concept of the fact that the reality that faith has an impact on your, your daily life. And I certainly don't think that should be controversial. 
uh, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, scientists uh, very often got their start, you know, as it emerged in Germany in the late 1600s. Uh, they got their start because there was a sense that the established church wasn't really doing much of its job. You know, it was not really feeding the people spiritually. Um, most pietists didn't advocate separation from the established church, but they oftentimes engaged in supplemental uh, fellowships that they called conventicles. And uh, so that's the way a lot of pietism went. Uh, some pietism went in a more radical direction uh, where you had people claiming enthusiastic ideas like direct communication with God, uh, apart from any sort of mediated mediated source. So things like this. I mean, there are radical pietists, but then there are churchly pietists as well. Pietism became established in the, the Nordic lands over the course of the years. And a lot of the church leaders in Denmark and Norway and Sweden as well um, were heavily influenced by pietistic literature. Uh, they would have some sort of a canon of devotional literature that they would often use, which oftentimes included even uh, spiritual writings from the late Middle Ages. Uh, people like Hans Tauler, uh, Heinrich Müller, and so forth. Uh, but a lot of these people, um, one person in particular was a, a Danish man named Eric Pontopadin. And Eric Pontopadin produced a version of Martin Luther's small catechism. Uh, that he called uh, uh, truth unto godliness. And it had like, I think at one point, maybe as many as 700 questions and answers uh, about different topics. And so Pontopadin's catechism became kind of the basis for confirmation instruction, especially in Norway. Um, hymns written by people like Thomas Kingo and so forth uh, were a part of this tradition as well. But Hans Nielsen Hauge was born in this era when pietism was a big part of the Norwegian church experience. But this was also the era of the enlightenment. Um, and a lot of times people think of those things as polar opposites, but actually some people have argued that, uh, that the enlightenment and pietism should be understood as a part of the same kind of phenomenon, uh, that they both exhibited a desire to improve society. Uh, pietists were very often uh, involved in works of mercy, mission, and so forth. Um, so a, a lot of the spread of Lutheranism around the world is rooted in, in the energy created by the pietistic tradition. But Hauge grew up in this uh, pietistic environment. Uh, he was a part of the established church in Norway, uh, but he also had um, this sort of pietistic literature in his upbringing. Uh, he was occupied with spiritual questions uh, from an early age, and uh, he had various um, situations where he had near-death experiences, uh, where he nearly drowned and so forth, and uh, he came to realize that he needed to uh, examine his life a little more fully, and so the dramatic story of his life uh, can kind of be compared to that of John Wesley's experience at Aldersgate Street in London. Uh, when John Wesley attended that meeting of Moravian Christians, and he said he felt his heart strangely warmed when he heard them reading from Martin Luther's uh, preface to the Romans. Um, Hans Nielsen Hauge, when he was a young man, so he was probably 25 at the time, he was plowing his field in his father's farm south of Oslo or Christiania, as it was called at the time, named after King Christian IV of Denmark. Uh, so that shows that Norway was still closely connected to Denmark. Uh, he was plowing the field and he was singing a hymn from memory. And it was called, Jesus I Long for Thy Blessed Communion. And he describes that while he was singing that hymn and plowing the field in the spring of uh, 1796, that he had an ecstatic experience, a mystical experience, where he felt that God was speaking to him. Now, this is one of the reasons why some people don't like Hauge, because they claim that, uh, well, he 
uh, he's claiming some sort of direct revelation from God. Like, but, like he's an enthusiast. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But how he how, how he always emphasized the scriptures, and he didn't he didn't believe that this was a regular kind of thing, but he believed that somehow God was speaking to him, and it led him back to um, a focus on the scriptures. But he believed that God had placed a calling on his life. And he desired to awaken his country because he saw that his country had fallen into spiritual slumber and that even though it was officially covered with churches all over the place, um, the true spiritual life of the people was lacking. So he, he began an eight-year period where he traversed Norway more than once. Uh, he led supplemental prayer and preaching meetings wherever he went. And the official law at the time required him to notify the parish pastor of holding any meetings like this, because the law required the pastor to approve of it or be present. Uh, it was called the Conventicle Act of 1741. And early on in his ministry, the local bailiff came to one of these meetings along with the parish pastor. And they got into an argument. And this shows that Hauge was really highly intelligent, even though he was not formally educated, like most people of his time. But he actually quoted the Conventicle Act in support of what he was doing, because he said the purpose of the Conventicle Act was actually to protect a wholesome and non-separatist form of pietism. Uh, and he said that the spirit of the law was not applicable in his situation. Well, anyway, he he was admonished. But as he continued his work throughout Norway, he was arrested multiple times for these charges. But what made Hauge especially fascinating for history is that he was not just a lay preacher. He was also very much a businessman. Uh, wherever he went, he used his ingenuity to try to get communities to become self-sufficient, to look at ways they could produce goods. Uh, he himself purchased uh, fishing operations on the western coast of Norway. Uh, he ran shipping operations. He established a paper mill in central Norway. Uh, he encouraged the development of bone mills and tanneries and other such things. And um, this was all something that helped to revitalize the Norwegian economy. And many people argue that Hauge was sort of the catalyst for eventually becoming a modern democratic society uh, in that he stirred up the local population in these communities to become active, and that included in politics. So uh, Hauge suffered a great deal. At one point, he was arrested and he was charged with fanaticism and his criticism of the clergy. Um, Hauge... He never encouraged people to leave the Church of Norway, but he was very critical of the clergy for what he saw as neglect of their duties. And um, he was also accused of violation of vagrancy laws because he lacked merchant licenses in places he would go. So he was charged with these things, including violation of the Conventicle Act, and he was imprisoned for 10 years. Um, but the movement that he sparked really continued to develop over the course of his imprisonment. Finally, his case was worked out and he was fined a certain amount of money, but his followers paid it for him. And uh, he died when he was still fairly young. I think he was 52 at uh, his farm south of Oslo. And he died in 1825 on March 29th. Now, he's commemorated, if you look in your, your hymnal, your uh, Green Lutheran Book of Worship, if you have a copy of it, he's uh, commemorated. We do at, uh, at the church, so um, I'm not with me, but yeah, <laughs> at the parish. He, he is commemorated as a renewer of the church on March 29th, and that leads into this encounter that I had with some of my classmates in uh, spring of 2004. It was a longstanding tradition at Luther Seminary to... Um, hold a party mocking his memory because what they knew of him was that he just he was uh legalistic and he didn't like uh he didn't like people 
drinking too much alcohol and so forth. And I was about to say, was that the complaint they had? Because I'm, I'm thinking Luther's. I could see like at like uh, Concordia St. Louis having a, a let's bash Hoggy party because he wasn't a confessional Lutheran. He was an enthusiast. But at Lu at an ELCA place, I'm like, do, do, I'm, I'm I'm not trying to talk ill, but like, do they really care on that about? Uh, it, it would be more like, oh, he doesn't let us, um, he, he's legalistic or something or too conservative. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I'm not really sure that their criticism was uh, rooted in any kind of uh, clarity of purpose. I, I think what they knew of him was really quite superficial. And part of it had to do with how he is associated with a low church style tendency. Uh, what happened is when Lutherans came to America, from Norway. Uh, interestingly, coincidentally, it began, immigration from Norway to America began the year following Hauge's death in 1825. And it remained fairly small, but eventually it would become a massive wave in the later 19th century. And so naturally, many of the Lutherans that came from Norway uh, were rooted in, in the Haugian revival tradition. When they came over here, they split into various organizations. There were some Lutherans that were rooted in the, the tradition of the Church of Norway. Uh, those folks eventually became this Norwegian synod, like I talked about. But there were those that were more influenced by the Haugian tradition, and they rejected the use of clerical vestments. Uh, the pastors would not wear official vestments. They would, Interestingly, they would often wear a Prince Albert frock coat, which is kind of defeats the whole purpose because only the pastor would wear the frock coat, you know, so it was kind of the unofficial vestment, you know, and, but they rejected that. They didn't use liturgical chanting. They didn't do that. Their, their worship style was more rooted in these conventicles that Haugi would lead. Uh, and of course they would supplement it with sacramental liturgy so they would use the, the order for baptism in the Norwegian hymnal. They would use the order for Holy Communion in the Norwegian hymnal. But uh, otherwise, it was much more, worship was much more spontaneous. You know, they didn't uh, use the established liturgy of the Church of Norway and Denmark uh, that the Norwegian Synod would, for example. So these two, these two tendencies kind of were like oil and water. They didn't like each other much. Uh, there was no love lost between them. One of the guys that was one of the Haugian preachers in America was a guy named Elling Eilsen. Elling Eilsen had a confrontation um, in the, the 1840s. He had a confrontation with one of the state church pastors from Norway who was trying to get control of the Norwegian church situation. And Elling Eilsen looked at him and grabbed this guy. His name was... Uh, Johannes Dietrichson. He grabbed Dietrichson by his beard and he said to him, listen to me, you Pope. I intend to plague you as long as I live. <laughs> so th these people didn't like each other much. And the fact that they ended up merging together uh, over the years in, in 1917 into a new church body called the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America, that is nothing short of a miracle. But when I, yeah, argue, I was about to ask, did that create tensions that would... Well, and that's actually what my dissertation is about, is talking about the coexistence of these different traditions from Norway um, in this new church body of 1917, the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America. You know, the historians of the previous century, they tended to downplay the existence of friction between these tendencies because they want to emphasize the triumph of merger and about how wonderful it is that we're all becoming one and we're putting aside our old differences. But what I explored in my dissertation was that this isn't really the happily ever after scenario that many people think it is. Uh, these differences in emphasis continue even within the, the merged church body. And eventually that group is going to change its name to after World War II, 1946, to simply the Evangelical Lutheran Church, uh, the ELC. And um, but throughout the history of the ELC, uh, 
you can see the differences in emphasis between the, the Haugian based people, Lutherans, and the more formal counterparts. And it's, it's a sad story in a lot of ways because um, both of those groups, in my opinion, have things to offer, mm -hmm. but it's just too bad that they, uh, they have such a history of friction with each other. Well, what was the fate? So, so you're talking about this kind of oil and water, like you say, church body that um, has this Haugian half and this uh, very non-Haugian half. It's, it's kind of given a more less ethnic, you know, more mainstream name post-World War II, but like how long, what did this end up merging into, into another group? Yeah. Which group? Yeah. Um, the ELC, the Norwegian group uh, ended up merging in 1960 with the, the ALC, the old ALC, the German group. Which was Germanic. Yeah. So yeah. that's another layer of um, interesting. Yeah. And then the other group to join that was a small Danish Lutheran group called the uh, United Evangelical Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting in the, the ALC of 1960, uh, and then a couple of years later, they were joined by a fourth group called the Lutheran Free Church, which interestingly also had a lot of influence from the Haugian tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't get enough votes to join the ALC in 1960. Uh, then finally, the year later, they did. So then they joined in 1962. And then a minority that didn't want to join the the ALC out of the Lutheran Free Church, they formed in 1963, a group called the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations. And that group still exists uh, today. Okay. Um, but, you know, so you get the ALC of 1960. Um, the ELC part of it, the Norwegian part of it, was just slightly larger than the German ALC part of it, so that the Norwegians really dominated the new ALC in terms of the leadership. Yeah. All of the uh, all the three presidents of the ALC of 1960 came out of the Norwegian background. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the guy that was elected president of the ALC at the outset was Frederick Schutz, who was the last president of the ELC. Mm -hmm. And then after that, a guy named Kent Knudsen, uh, a very Norwegian name. Uh, Kent Knudsen was a theologian, a professor at Luther Seminary. Uh, he was elected president of the ALC. And then sadly, he died of some neurodegenerative disease um, after a few years. And then at that point, then David Preuss, who also came out of the Norwegian background, um, he was elected president of the ALC. Interestingly, uh, David Preuss's would be his grandfather, I believe. His grandfather was one of the early grand poobahs, you might say, of the uh, uh, Norwegian synod tradition. So he represented the more high church Norwegians. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a chance to interview David Preuss um, back in 2020. Oh, yeah. Uh, David Preuss passed away a few years ago, um, a very nice man, um, but he was a very significant leader in American Lutheranism. But I was asking him about how he, as the president, kind of saw these various pieties in his organization. And, uh, you know, he talked about how these independent type ministries that are in existence, groups like the World Mission Prayer League. Uh, which is an independent Lutheran ministry, uh, various other groups like this. What I did in my dissertation is I looked at the origins of these kinds of independent ministries. And what I realized, what I discovered is that a lot of them have their roots, at least indirectly, if not directly, in the influence of the Haugian revival of Norway. Okay. Um, and partially this was done, I think, because the Haugians you know, they were okay with being a part of the official church organization, mm -hmm. but they didn't always trust everything that was coming out of the officialdom of the, of the church body. Sure. And they felt that they wanted to do their own thing in addition to it, which is kind of in the blood of the original, you know, it comes out of the tradition of the original Haugian movement in Norway. Mm -hmm. You know, they're willing to function within the church of Norway, but they're not necessarily trustful of of what's coming out of it yeah 
Um, so I'm going to, this question, and we might be um, digress, well, not digressing, but shifting gears from how, and there might be some relationship here, but it seems like there was another awakening movement that I wanted you to speak to. Um, and I might butcher some names. I think I pronounced it earlier when I was talking with you in the pre the pre-show. Um, but this has to more to do with the Church of Sweden. Um, there's an awakening movement there, you said, that was led by Lars Levy Lestadius. Am I pronouncing that right? Lars Levi Lestadius, yeah. Lestadius, who lived 1800 to 1861. And I'll just uh, quote from a, a piece of writing, which I'll put in the show notes, a uh, link for our readers can read the whole thing. Uh, he said, You say, quote, a pastor in the state church of Sweden, uh, which is a Lutheran church, of course, sometimes called the prophet of Lapland. Uh, Lestadius carried out his ministry in the region of the Arctic Circle, where Finland, Norway, and Sweden share borders. Therefore, the revival movement that bore his name influenced all of these Nordic countries to some extent, though it was in Finland that Lestadian influence took root most deeply. In 1826, he received an appointment as the pastor of a remote parish in the Swedish Lapland, Though there was a spirit of stagnation in this parish regarding spiritual matters, Lestadius was not overly concerned. In addition to theology, he had an interest in botany, and some commentators remarked that his passion for the study of plants exceeded his passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He would come to understand later that what he taught during that time had more to do with head knowledge than with Christian conviction. As Lestadius became, serious, became seriously ill, for the second time in his life in 1842, for the first time he reflected on his eternal destiny. His illness caused him to recognize his poverty of spirit and the same ungodliness that existed within his parish. Upon his recovery, he began to emphasize what others would call living Christianity, something that moved beyond a focus on doctrine and morals. For him, it was not enough to simply try to be a better person. What truly produces Christian people is the recognition that their emptiness can only be filled with the righteousness of Christ. Um, so Lestadius, he sounds kind of similar from what you wrote there to Hauge. This, it, it seems like, well, well, Hauge, he has, he, I like how you liken him to, to John Wesley. Hauge had kind of this, um, kind of like how Wesley did within the Church of England and eventually went outward as the Methodist movement. Uh, Hauge had this kind of um, warming of heart. So did Lestadius, though, kind of in a uh, moment of crisis and realizing his um I guess you say his spiritual poverty what um what was that movement about you, you say how um you mentioned interestingly how there was because of his emphasis on the need need for a public recounting of sins this is very interesting Lestadians as they I guess they're called people who follow in his footsteps uh refused to use curtains in homes so as to avoid engaging in secret uh, sins. So it sounds a little bit kind of le legalistic. Um, I hate to use the term this way because of puritanical in a way, at least popular, what we think of Puritans. Uh, what's up with this this guy? What was his movement like? Was it, um, were they legalistic in, uh, or was it really uh it, yeah <laughs> tell me a little i guess be, before we close I, I i maybe tell us a little bit about the this group okay well the first thing that i i want to say about the swedish situation that it's important for everyone to understand is that there were a variety of revivals that were active in different parts of sweden uh in the 19th century and these were roughly contemporaries of people like hans nielsen Hauge in norway um these different revival movements in Sweden were often very different in character. And Lestadius is under, best understood as one of these types of revivals. Uh, eventually, there was there would come to be a guy named Carl Olaf Rossinius. And Rossinius, I think more than anything, helped to provide some unity with these types of revivals. Uh, Rossinius was known, he was a lay person, just like Hauge. And Rosinius was mostly influential through his publication uh, called, translated as the Pietist, actually. Uh, that's how his ideas came to be disseminated more than anything. And he was actually influenced by an American Methodist named uh, George Scott. Uh, so there was some American influence in there as well. 
But Lestadius um, active mostly in the early part of the 19th century in the far northern region of the Nordic lands. Um, so the prophet of Lapland. Um, I will say about the tradition that came out of Lestadius is that it's probably the most enigmatic part of Lutheranism in America, especially, but in uh, in the old countries as well. It became known mostly as a Finnish movement, um, even though Lestadius himself was Swedish. Um, Lestadius emphasized public recounting of sins, uh, the declaration of absolution, um, and this this led to some types of, there are different types of Lestadians. They've splintered into different movements. Um, they didn't really become a part of American church life until really the early 20th century. Uh, Finnish immigration to America was actually fairly late in the game by the time that it occurred. And it wasn't nearly as large as the Norwegian situation, for example. Um, the Norwegians, uh, interestingly, there, there's only one other country in Europe that gave up a greater percentage of its population to immigration than Norway, and that would be Ireland. Um, so the Norwegians really hemorrhaged a lot of people. And for that reason, the Norwegians came to dominate the Danes in America because Danish immigration was just not nearly as large. So the fortunes were kind of reversed there. But when it comes to the Finns, they didn't really start coming to America until about the 1920s. And by that time, a lot of the land had really been claimed, so to speak. And so Finns ended up uh, ended up settling in places like northern Michigan. Uh, there are a lot of them, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, parts of nor northeastern Minnesota, uh, and just scattered communities here and there. But wherever there were Finnish settlements, uh, you would tend to have some Lestadian congregations. And these Lestadians uh, came, came to exhibit different types of things. Some of these uh, congregations came to call themselves apostolic Lutherans. Uh, and then there is also like the Lestadian Lutheran Church of America. Um, when I hear apostolic, I think of some of these like... Um restorationist christian movements like in the late 19th century groups that said um no christian group has gotten it they've all veered we need to go back to restoring the church as seen in the new testament is that it, fair or no i don't know it's just the the when i hear that that's what it yeah like. i mean th this is this is kind of a, a different breed of cat in that what happened is that some of these lestadian congregations kind of, you could call them maybe Lutheran Amish in some ways. Uh, there was a community in South Dakota, actually. It's actually not terribly far from Brookings, South Dakota, where ILT is based out of. Uh, Lake Norden, South Dakota. There is a congregation there of Lestadian Lutherans and uh, or Apostolic Lutherans. And they, they wear distinctive dress, they they reject a lot of modern technology. They discourage higher education. Um, they're very separatist. You might say even sectarian. And I have never spoken to any of them myself, but I just know from what I've heard from other people. You know, they're not involved in the public school system, for example. So it leads to some interesting politics because the size of your school district determines, you know, what... Um, classification your sports teams in high school uh, are in. And so they have to apply for like a waiver from the state saying like we have this heavy population of these apostolic Lutherans, but they don't participate in our, our school district. So don't count that against us in classifying us, um, you know, as class A or class B for football, <laughs> whatever. Uh, what I know of these groups is that um, they run a spectrum from being very like anti-technology separatist to some of them that are more, you might say, are kind of like more evangelical type 
American evangelical type. Uh, some of those congregations are probably similar to what you would find in the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, for example. Uh, so th there is there's variety there. Yeah, but they they focus on like the pronouncement of absolution. And uh, I've heard a I heard a really moving story. Uh, actually, the place that I heard it was uh, Jim Nestigan, uh, who passed away recently. Mm -hmm. Uh, many will recognize his name, but yeah, we did talked... a whole episode on Jim with one of his former students. It was a wonderful tribute we did to him. So, mm -hmm. well, Jim Nestigan um, tells of his observation of one of these apostolic Lutheran congregations coming out of the Lestadian tradition about how the families would come forward for communion, and when they would do this, uh, the head of the household would first absolve like his wife and then his wife would absolve the children and then the children would, would absolve each other and then they would serve each other communion um and um so it's um it is it is it is different it's an enigmatic kind of thing mm -hmm. uh and there's some as i said some lestadian congregations would reject the use of curtains in their homes um because obviously if if you have nothing to hide you don't need to have curtains and you don't need curtains right Right. Um, so I guess if if you you know if you if you're those if you're one of those types that take a shower and walk around after before you get dressed, uh, you uh, you can't be able to stadium. So right. <laughs> <laughs> so. It is. Um. You know. It is. I, I think when it comes to legalism, um, I think it's always important to remember that legalism takes many shapes and forms. Oh sure. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. know certainly it's possible to understand about anything in a legalistic fashion. Mm -hmm. But I think at its best, you know, a lot of these traditions understand what they do as an outgrowth of their, their faith, mm -hmm. uh, not simply as something they're trying to do to appease God. Although there probably are people who do think that, but um, that's not probably what the original intent was. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, we have heard from you too. I mean, basically, I think is it fair to call them two Nordic revival movements that had their influence, a definite influence in North American, not only in North American church denominations, but in North American communities. Um, and that's fascinating history. I did not know that there's kind of like an Amish version of uh, Lutherans in, in the upper Midwest. That's um, yeah. Yeah uh dr jacobs this has been uh this has been a treat really um this is and and as we decided through the episode and as you'll you listeners will have figured out as as you're listening to it this is uh the second part of a two-part uh series that we got on um christianity as it come comes out of norway um as the reformation happens in norway and as uh the the spread of christianity to the states from from Norway um, and from this Nordic countries, um, how it just makes for such uh, a, an interesting uh, discussion. So, uh, thank you for coming on the show, and I uh, would love to have you on again in the future. And um, yeah, God bless. Thanks, Drew. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>